Hello, my name is Joseph Gormley, and I am the parish priest of Holy Family Parish, Balmagorty in Derry City. And you're very welcome to our Advent Reflection Series here at EW2M. I'm speaking here from St. Catherine's Church in Newry in Ireland. And over the four weeks of Advent, we are looking at the Sunday Gospels, where a different priest gives a reflection on the Gospel for that week of Advent. Looking this week at Mark's Gospel on the second Sunday of Advent. I don't know if you've read the book by C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters. C.S. Lewis was a great apologist for the Christian faith. But the screw tape letters tells of the conversation between an adult devil uh, called Wormwood and his nephew Screwtape. And it's really about the spiritual life and about the battle of the spiritual life, where the de de these two devils planned to take human beings away from God by various tricks. Now, one of the tricks that they let us into is the fact that Wormwood advises Screwtape the most important thing to do is to keep human beings away from thinking of the present moment and also to keep them away of thinking of eternity. Keep them fix fixated on the past. Let them worry about the future, but don't live in the present moment. They say that that's what God wants us to do, so they're going to try and mess up God's plans for us. This is a challenge in the spiritual life. This is the reality of the spiritual battle for all of us. We face every day. Because often our thoughts are in the past of what's just happened to us or some hurt or something we've done or failed to do and we feel guilt. Or we're worried about the consequences of the future. And as a result of that, we fail to live in the present moment. And often what we do, rather than live in the present moment, we fill our lives with distractions. The philosopher Blaise Pascal said that our lives are full of distractions. And this is particularly so in our Western secular culture because it doesn't want us to listen to the present moment. Behind the facade of progress, of unbridled pleasure, the many choices you want, the rampant individualism, and being whoever you want to be is all presented to us as a way to stop us living in the present moment. And what it does is that it leaves a pain in the, an ache in every human heart that is not consoled. And that we seek to console it by using various experiences, relationships, various even drugs and alcohol, not to live in the present moment. And what it does to us when we don't face this ache within us is that we can numb our, us to our real value and worth. And we could just become blind consumers of things and using things for our own ends or using people for our own ends. And our life becomes one of our right to make us happy. But the secular culture we live in leads us blindly into a wilderness. A wilderness of the sameness. A wilderness of superficiality. A, willingness that, a wilderness that wants us to think that our uniqueness can be created by ourselves rather than something that has been given to us by God our Creator. I, as a priest, am privileged to serve for the last 27 years. But I have seen the pain of this wilderness in people's lives, and people are aware of it because they're not being consoled by the Lord. We find in the second Sunday of Advent's Gospel from Mark a voice, a voice crying in this wilderness to us. 
And let us listen to that gospel now. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, Look, I am going to send my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare a way for the Lord. Make his path straight. And so it was that John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. All Judea, all people of Jerusalem made their way to him. And as they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, they confessed their sins. John wore a garment of camel skin, and he lived on locusts and wild honey. In the course of his preaching, he said, Someone is following me, someone who is more powerful than I am, and I am not fit to kneel down and undo the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. The voice crying in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord, is taken from the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet spoke to the people of Israel when they were in exile in Babylon. And he was telling them that their time of exile was over. And we hear about that in our first reading this Sunday. We hear about the consolation, console my people, console them. The Lord tells the people in exile. We may not be exiled in a foreign country, but we are exiled often from the, our true selves. The people of Israel seeking to be someone other than whom God called them to be ended up far away from their home in Babylon. And we can be in that wilderness too in our own hearts. But the Lord tells us that he is coming to us. He is coming to console us. And John the Baptist is his herald. Jesus is coming to us. And this is a time when we make ourselves ready. Often, however, we don't listen to the voice. Because... We haven't yet realized we are living in this wilderness. And we are all in this wilderness. And if to deny it is to close our ears to the voice of John the Baptist. This figure of John the Baptist, a man whom we're told who wore a garment of camel skin and lived in locusts of wild honey, would be seen as an oddity. But there was something about him that made him authentic. Superficiality was surely there in Jesus' time too, living on the surface. But there was something about John the Baptist that called people to something deeper. And that is why the people went to hear him. All Judea and all the people of Jerusalem made the way to him. They knew that God was breaking through in their lives but they didn't know how. And sometimes in our lives too, it takes us to break down before there's a breakthrough. I have a good friend who struggled with addiction for years and he said the moment of his breakdown was the moment of God breaking through. The Lord comes into our lives. Those moments when we think our life has fallen apart, maybe it's beginning to fall into place because the Lord is coming into our lives. And then we begin to ask ourselves the questions that really matter. The questions at the heart of every person's meaning and existence. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? We can only do that in the present moment. We can't look for solutions to those questions in ways of thinking and acting which will ultimately do us ourselves harm. We are, must see 
that those questions can only be answered when we allow the Lord to come to us. When we allow him to make, we make space for him to make his path straight. Life has got so complicated for, for all of us. Yes, we have so many choices, but we have so much distraction which has made our life so complicated. I know that myself. I know that the struggle every day not to allow myself to get distracted, but to make that space and time for the Lord to come and to speak his words, his consoling words, his words to tell me that he forgives me my sins, he loves me, and he asks me to rely not on myself, but on the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what John the Baptist preached to the people who came to hear him. He said, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And our lives, life's meaning is not to be found really in a self-help book or in some way of thinking, but rather it is to be found in the person of Jesus Christ. We are called to repent and to listen to the good news that Jesus brings to us. Friends, join us in a few moments when we'll be looking further at the gospel of the second Sunday of Advent and how we can repent and prepare a way for the Lord. Welcome back to our second week of Advent Reflection Series here on EWTN. Before the break, we had just listened to the Gospel according to Mark about the good news of Jesus Christ and the words of John the Baptist, prepare a way for the Lord. Now we're going to think about what that means in the context of living in the present moment, because as we know, to live in the present moment is the place we encounter God. It's the place we encounter Jesus Christ. When we think of Advent, we automatically think that we're preparing for the coming of Christ at Christmas time, which we are. That's the first coming we're, we, we are, are celebrating. And also the readings of, uh, of the Advent also point to the coming of Christ at the end of time. A very, very important event. When the new heaven and the new earth will be revealed by Christ. But we are called to live between those two moments in the, in the present moment. And as we heard, the one thing in the spiritual battle that we need to repent of is from living in the past or trying to control our future. That is the repentance that we're called to have by John the Baptist. The repentance means repentance means to rethink to renew our minds in new ways of thinking the problem is that our minds often get fixated i know my mind does anyway it gets fixated on our pasts on our failures often on our sins how we failed others how we failed ourselves or we often get fixated on the way others have failed us. And when this happens, we are filled often with two things, bitterness at what has happened to us and guilt about what we've done. And this environment of bitterness and guilt, we are led into a wilderness that we often fly to in the addictive culture of today. We all do it to a smaller or greater extent. It's more obvious in the, those who have addictions who are, who are present amongst us and we can say, but all of us flee from the present moment. And you know, sometimes even in the best of moments, 
when we've been gifted by something, we can often feel guilty. And that is because we think that what we have is our own, not gift, that we must achieve it. And that is why we try and control our future, which is the second part of repentance, of surrender to God. And because we haven't achieved something that has been given to us, we never think it is ours. We lose the sense of gift. This is why even the most successful people who have, who, who have achieved a lot, what happens to them? They've lost the sense of what's really important. They've achieved in one level, but how often do we hear, and how often is the same for us, that when it comes to answering the basic questions or allowing the basic questions of who am I, why am I here, where am I going, they run away from them, as we all do. We put achievement to success as the source of happiness. And we tell ourselves we will only be happy if we achieve. But even the greatest tennis player or footballer, there comes a time when there's somebody going to be better. And they lose sight of who, we, who they are. And we can do that too. If we base our lives living and trying to achieve in the future. We lose a sense of who we really are. Why we are here the ultimate purpose of our life, eternity. We lose a sense of the present moment and eternity and fall into the trap of screw tape and wormwood of living in the past and trying to control the future. The Christian life, however, the good news that is proclaimed by John the Baptist, the good news that Mark tells us is good news, is that the Christian life is not about achieving. It's about receiving. It's about receiving that love that only God can give us, that is given to us as a child born in the manger in Bethlehem, was given to us 2,000 years ago, Jesus who suffered, died, and rose for us, and who comes to us every day because of the fact that he became one of us. He take, took on our, our, all our afflictions. He was truly human, but without sin, because he trusted totally in God his Father. He knew who he was, that he was God's beloved Son, and we need to live in the present moment to know who we are, God's beloved sons and daughters, in whom he is well pleased, whose love for us does not depend on our achievements, is still there for us, should we commit the worst sins? St. Therese of it is you was so aware of this. The problem is we are not present to that love. And that is what we are called to do, to prepare a way for the Lord into our hearts. That love is not a theory. That love is not some fuzzy feeling. That love is a person, Jesus Christ. And our life as Christians is about a relationship with that person, as Pope Benedict has so, so often told us. It's not about a set of moral codes. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in that relationship, we are transformed because we know then who we are, why we're here, and where we're going. We are defined by Jesus. Jesus came to reveal God the Father to us, but he also came to reveal who we are and why we're here and where we're going. The Catechism taught that why are we here? Our parents and grandparents would have known that they were told to know and love and serve God in this life and so we'd be eternally happy with him in the next. In order to do that, we must allow God's love to touch us, to change us. Because God won't force his love upon us. He asks us to trust, to trust that his love 
is enough for us. And that is what repentance is about. The Lord is so patient with us also. In our second reading for this, on this Sunday, we hear about how we're waiting for the coming of Christ at the end of time. But we also hear that the Lord is patient with us, not wanting any of us to be lost. The Lord never gives up on us. But if we give up on the Lord, we give up on ourselves. Because then we have not allowed ourselves to see who we really are. And we are thrown in to the despair of wilderness, the despair of loneliness, the despair of lack of faith. God will not force his love upon us. What he asks of us is to be humble, to know we need it. We are preparing for the coming of a Savior. And the first thing on that journey is to know we need to be saved, to be saved from our own way of thinking and to be saved by the love of God. We are asked, do we trust that love? Do we hunger for that love? But in today's world, as I mentioned, in the last se section, we are so easily distracted, so easily distracted by so many things, by so much junk. We fill our lives, so much so that at the end of time, we are like children who have been to McDonald's or to other junk food, for junk food. And what has happened to them is that they have filled their lives with that and they're not hungry for the banquet. We all like a McDonald's or a fast food sometime, but to live our life with it is to take away from the real purpose of our lives. This acceptance of God's love comes through what John the Baptist talks about, baptizing with the Holy Spirit. The gospel contains today the whole movement of salvation from proclamation to repentance to forgiveness and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes not to replace Jesus but to place Jesus in the present moment to allow his saving action to take place. This saves us from being preoccupied with our past and trying to control the future. And that is why when we pray, we should ask the Holy Spirit first of all so that we can come into the presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus present to us. He's already there, but he changes our minds to make us aware of his presence. In today's world, people are running away from the presence of God and think that they need to redeem and save themselves. But there's only one way we can be saved, by looking, as John the Baptist will point to the Lamb of God who takes away my and your sin. Sin is basically lack of trust. Placing our trust in things apart from God and those things that will not help us and our eternal relationship with God. And God can break through at any moment. A moment in time is like a thousand years, as we have heard in our second reading for this Sunday. God can break through because he's not waiting on us. We are called to trust that his love will never, never abandon us. In the second reading, we hear how the, a thousand years is as, as much as a year to the Lord. And he is not, time is something that is beyond us. And there are two concepts of time in the Greek world and which we have lost sense of. There's the chronos, which is the clock time, which goes from 
time passes and the seasons pass, and there's kairos, which is the Lord's moment. And every moment can be a moment when the Lord reaches out to save us. And the people who have realized this most of all, I believe, is those people who have had that breakdown and breakthrough in their lives. Those who, through addiction, have found to live in the present moment. To live in the present moment with one eye on eternity. To have the humility of Mary to say yes to Jesus coming to them. And to be able to say that the Lord is here and we need not be afraid because he has come to save and redeem us. One of the greatest prayers that those who suffer from addiction say is the serenity prayer. And we know that version perhaps, the short version. But a number of years ago, somebody pointed out to me there's a longer version of it, which tells us of how we're meant to live in the present moment and also to keep our eyes on eternity. Let me share that with you. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him in the next. Lord, help us to meet you in the present moment so that we will meet you forever in eternity. Next week, we will be continuing our Advent series reflecting on the Gospel of the third Sunday of Advent. We look forward to you tuning in then. Amen.